Welcome to episode three of 10 Minute Country, um, in which we look at uh, the divisions within country music uh, and actually put forward a hypothesis that whilst the continued sniping and arguments within the genre uh, are both unnecessary and repetitive, it might well be ultimately beneficial for all concerned. Division within country music is almost as old as the genre itself. Um, I've encountered it even here in the UK, which is still at the start of a sort of embryonic country journey. Um, I'm constantly plagued on Facebook by fans of the traditional side of the genre and purists uh, saying that the music I like isn't country uh, and that the albums that I review and the artists that I interview shouldn't really be included in any country publications. Uh, My masculinity has even been called into question because I like the Shires amongst hundreds of other artists uh, and every every review I publish usually receives some sort of negative or sarcastic comment Uh, from a traditional or country music purist saying, that's not country music. Uh, The division and rivalry fascinates me. Back in the 80s, I was a huge fan of hard rock and heavy metal, which, as a genre, is is as subdivided as country music is. Uh, But it doesn't have any of the rivalries or or bitching that plagues country music. I tended to like the more melodic, harmony-driven stuff like Bon Jovi and Def Leppard, Aerosmith, Poison, Cinderella... Uh, Yeah, I was big friends with many guys who were into the heavier bands and thrash metal and even stuff like the death metal. And there was some gentle rivalry and some teasing between us about the peculiarities and and stereotypes of each part of uh, the Venn diagram of rock music. But we did ultimately all band together in what we thought was like a secret little club against all the normals. And it felt like we belonged to something outside of the mainstream, which, which bonded us all together. This does not happen in country music at all, quite the opposite in fact. Country music is racked with internal division and constant civil war. Uh, The good news, I reckon, is that it's always been like this. Um, It's something the genre has learned to live with and even profligate from. Billboard magazine wrote in 2016 that country is a genre perpetually battling itself and uh, NPR, National Public Radio, paints country music as a genre where innovation tugs constantly against preservation. This is a battle that, as a singing Disney teacup once said, is is a tale as old as time. When rock and roll began to emerge in the 40s and the 50s, it was regarded with suspicion by country music purists and the singing cowboys of the 30s like Gene Autry. Uh, He remains the only individual to have been awarded a Hollywood star in every category, oddly enough. Yet the melding of rock and roll and country led to Honky Tonk, which is a sound so redolent of the American South these days. That polished Nashville sound of the 50s gave rise to the Bakersfield rebel sound of the 60s, which Buck Owens was the poster boy for. And the disco-infused country sound banged heads against the outlaw sound of Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson in the 70s and 80s. Interestingly though, Johnny Cash said on his show in 1971... In its 50-year history, country music has been constantly evolving into newer and different styles. And today, in 1971, interestingly the year I was born, we have what is called the modern sound. To some, it's for the better. To others, modern country music is unacceptable. And then he went on to introduce a new modern singer called Merle Haggard. Tickles me, that does. Radio DJ Bobby Bobby Bones said in his new book, Fail Until You Don't. The country format rightfully takes pride in its roots, but at times adherence to those roots can be counterproductive to making great music. Anything with a new sound is often fought tooth and nail against by the purists, and the term, that's not country, is used too often as a definition, when really it's just one person's opinion. The irony is that many of the successful artists I've talked to about this idea were told they weren't country either. Garth Brooks being the biggest example. He told me he was tagged with the label That's Not Country many times after he moved to Nashville. Yet now we see Brooks as a staple and a legend of the format. I'd like to suggest that country music is the equivalent of the Batman villain Harvey Two-Faced Dent. There is a symbiotic relationship between the modern and the traditional sides of the genre. Without the historical grounding of the traditionalists, country music, dragged along by the labels and the lure of the dollar, gets pulled in an internal game of -of tug-of-war more towards the pop side. 
whilst the purists, meanwhile, gain definition from battling the crossover artists, giving them a creative purpose and polishing them with this veneer of counterculture. In an ideal world, the tension between the two sides would push each other to achieve more. Country music is forward-thinking, progressive and ready to explore new sounds. But without this, the traditionalists might well stagnate, becoming nothing more than just anachronistic, nostalgic people, like those Civil War reenactors you see at American tourist attractions. In fact, those words, forward-thinking and progressive, which don't really go with the traditional side of the genre, sum up the work of arch-counterculture artist Sturgill Simpson. So it just shows that the music of the Old South and the music of the purists can be progressive and forward-thinking. The modern artists, meanwhile, need the gravitas and the import of the weight of history and culture that the purists bring. They need to understand their roots and where the music that they seemingly love comes from, so that they can understand its cultural relevance and their fan base too. It's two-faced. It's a symbiotic relationship. For every Sam Hunt, there's a Sturgill Simpson. For every Kane Brown, there's a Cale Tyson or Sam Outlaw. Each side needs the other one to spur them along. Without the dialogue, without the discussion, competition and scorn, the two sides of the genre might well just collapse in on themselves in a maelstrom of complacency, arrogance and hubris. What could be a lot better, however, is the constant sniping from the fans on social media. Um, some people spend so much of their time pulling down what they don't like instead of building up what they do, it's amazing. And I'm going back to Bobby Bones again on this. In his book Fail Until You Don't, he writes the following... You are getting absolutely nothing accomplished by aiming negative thoughts at someone else's actions. You're wasting your own time when you could be accomplishing something yourself. It's okay that not everyone likes you, and you don't have to like everything either. But use your time and energy to build up things instead of tearing them down. Nothing ever came from being critical of the accomplishments of others. So next time you hear an album you can't stand, or an artist that offends your country sensibilities, or you read a review of mine that you utterly disagree with, why not just brush it off and go and create something of your own instead of losing hours of your life arguing about it on social media? And try and pr process the idea that that's not country argument has been raging for about 80 years now, and it'll probably still be raging long after we're dead and gone. It's not a bad thing. It creates tension, and tension births creativity. It's ultimately positive. Embrace it. Use it to build something of your own, and let's dial down the social media hatred. Country music needs Sam Hunt, and it needs Walker Hayes, just as much as it does Margot Price, the Turnpike Troubadours, and Joshua Headley.